Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona, it's time for Valley Business Radio, spotlighting the Valley's best businesses and the people who lead them. Hello and welcome to Valley Business Radio, where we tell the stories that traditional media tends to ignore and help connect you to the right people. I'm your host, Dr. Adrian McIntyre, and I'm joined in the studio today by Mike Neely, Executive Director of the Fiesta Bowl, and Patrick Barkley, Chairman of the Board of the Fiesta Bowl. It's football, it's Fiesta Bowl, it's a Valley tradition, and we're going to hear all about it on today's show. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks. Great to be here. Now, I was just learning this history. I'm not from Arizona. I wasn't even much of a football fan. My high school was Revenge of the Nerds and not on the fraternity <laughs> side of the equation. And... Um, I'm curious to know, because this is a really big deal. Can you tell us, Mike, a little bit about the history of this important event? When did the Fiesta Bowl get started and what's it all about? 49 years ago. You know, we're on our 49th game, so it's quite a bit of history. and We're looking forward to uh, celebrating 50 years, which is amazing. If you think back, and I think that the founders that got together, the businessmen that got together years back, and decided that to have a game. And um, the story goes, as uh, Arizona State was a pretty good football team back then, but got snubbed a few years in a row in, in the bowl business. And uh, uh, the short story is, I, I think the business leaders decided to have their own bowl and invite Arizona State to that game. So that's that's the quick story of how it originated. And Arizona State was, was in the first couple of bowl games themselves. And then uh, uh, the bowl business has grown since then, and uh, the, the Fiesta Bowl itself certainly has uh, grown, and I'm sure we'll get into a, a lot of what we're doing nowadays. Absolutely. And even though you know, I, I say I wasn't much of a football fan growing up, I grew up in Southern California, where the Rose Bowl was a huge deal, and the Rose Bowl Parade, which we went to every year as a family. We never went to the game. We always went to the parade. Patrick, the, the Fiesta Bowl is not just a game. There's a lot that's going on in a 24-hour period in December. Can you flesh out a bit what are some of the activities that happen around this whole entire set of events? Sure. Uh, we're actually active uh, pretty much throughout the year, but uh, you know, there's a heavy concentration here in December. So uh, on the 27th, we've got our Cheez-It Bowl, uh, which is the Pac-12 versus the uh, uh, Big 12. And then we've also got the parade the next morning, uh, so that's about uh, 200,000 people that uh, that come across the valley and across the state and uh, enjoy some festivities there. And then we've got our Fiesta Bowl game uh, on uh, the 28th. Now, I want to get into a little more details of those set of events. I think a lot of folks are going to be interested in how they can participate, and there's a number of different avenues for that. But I'm curious to know, for both of you, talk to me a little bit about your own backstory. How did you get involved in this, Mike? You've been involved in sports marketing for a long time, and now you have this position as executive director of the Arizona Sports Foundation and the Valley of the Sun Bowl Foundation. Can you walk us through that journey? Where did it start for you, and how did you end up here? Well, probably I'd start back, you know, I have uh, Minnesota roots. So, I, you know, I grew up born and raised, and of course I was familiar with the uh, Fiesta Bowl and was a football fan. So from afar, uh, watched that, uh, uh, you know, as I was younger. I, when I got into the sports business, it was more on the hockey side. And, and believe it or not, hockey actually brought me down to the Valley about 14 years ago. But a little over five years ago, made that transition over to the Fiesta Bowl. A lot of things were changing in the bowl business, and it was it was a good opportunity, a good fit for me to come over and uh, kind of use some of the skills that I've uh, that I acquired through my uh, NHL experience. And it was the right time. You know, and it just was awesome to be a part of this uh, organization. And you had studied sports marketing or sports business in college in Minnesota? Or? Well, that, that's probably a little bit of a stretch. Right. You know, no, I, I, I was in business, but mostly finance. And you know, my, my pre-sports world was more in the finance world. So there, there's not a real direct line of, of myself getting into sports and then directly into the, the football side. Uh, um, I suppose you could... Uh, uh, network uh, a string of how this happened, but, you know, being involved in sports and, and, and being important in my life. So it was always a, an interest of mine, but I did not pursue a sports career or a sports marketing career, but found myself in that, uh, that mode and, uh, and, and have loved it ever since. So it's, it's been a long, it's been a long journey now and really enjoying what we're doing, but uh, I, I can't admit that was a, a goal. Well, I got to tell you, listen, we interview executives, senior business leaders, business owners, entrepreneurs, young founders. Nobody expects to end up where they are, except for that one kid uh, who had a master plan that they followed from the age of 11 or something. But that's the exception more than it is the rule. Even athletes themselves who really 
never had a vision for their life or their career past the end of the highest level of achievement that they were able to reach in their athletic career and then end up at 32, 38, yeah. 40 uh, yeah. with a whole second and third act ahead of them. So the idea that this isn't all kind of thought through from the beginning is actually quite – Right. Quite familiar to me as I talk to a lot of people. You know, some people are fortunate enough to maybe really know what they want to do, like you said, but that's uh, few and far between. But uh, as I just tell people, because a lot of people are interested, how do you get into sports? It's so neat. And uh, work hard at whatever you're doing and, ha and have fun doing what you're doing. You never know where life's going to bring you. But uh, now I want to circle back and ask you a couple of follow up questions um, about the difference between a hockey organization and football related organization. But, Patrick, I'm curious as well about your backstory. You, you come also out of, a, of finance and banking kind of a background. How did you end up uh, in this role? Yeah, so my uh, day job is uh, commercial mortgage banking. Uh, so a, a company called Gantry, and we do uh, financing for a wide variety of properties all across the U.S. And, uh, you know, with this, I, I started out as a volunteer 25 years ago. I uh, was a volunteer for the hole-in-one tournament. Actually, my, my mother-in-law and my, my wife were, were both ambassadors. They were part of a, uh, one of our volunteer groups uh, and uh, got me involved and uh, started volunteering there, uh, joined the committee as a Fiesta Future, was a future for two years, kind of worked my way up to the committee, uh, got on the committee and, and had a great time. I mean, you know, you just have a wide variety of jobs, um, you know, working game operations, uh, you know, working at the parade, uh, a wide variety of things. Uh, so uh, then had the opportunity to be the committee chair uh, a few years ago and then uh, was invited to be on the board. And and uh, I think they just keep on promoting me to get rid of me soon someday. So <laughs> that was my elementary and high school experience. Although it was like, well, the end of the year comes. I think we should just move him to the next level because otherwise he'll be here again. Exactly. Uh, but you mentioned volunteering, and I'm glad you brought that up because that is a huge part of what's happening around the Fiesta Bowl and the associated events. There are going to be over 3,000 volunteers this year doing all kinds of things, right, from uh, balloon handlers to bicycle security, equestrian staging, information booth attendants, logistics, marshals, shuttle buses, all the things. Like This takes a huge amount oh, yeah. of human labor. And a minute ago, Mike said people want to know how do you get into sports. Well, there's an answer. That was your path. Sure. You started out as a volunteer. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it uh, you know it's an opportunity to to be involved and and kind of live out that dream to be you know on the field and and you know be a uh, a liaison with the teams. I mean, you know, it's a wide variety of, of of great opportunities. Now, I understand that with any kind of enormous production, there's always a need for extra help. But a lot of folks might be intimidated, even if they're intrigued by what we're talking about. They might not realize. Uh, how friendly and welcoming of an environment they may find themselves in. Could you speak to that if somebody has never participated in an event like this before, maybe their recent arrival here in the Valley, uh, what's the pathway for them to begin participating as a volunteer? Well, the, the pathway is to, to go on fiestival.org and, uh, and sign up there. But uh, we have needs everywhere, and it, it can be a situation where you're, you know, at the uh, PlayStation Festival and uh, greeting people, uh, or you know, helping people figure out where they need to go for pregame parties. Uh, you know, you can work your way up to be a parade marshal, or uh, you could be on game operations. Uh, so, volunteers are are you know embedded throughout our organization. Mike, you mentioned a number of times the bowl business. And I'm curious to unpack that a little sure. bit Can, for somebody who's a complete outsider to this. Uh, what is the bowl business? How does it work? Who are the players? What's involved? Sure. Well, the, the bowl business has grown over the years in you know the, the older days uh, of only a handful of bowls. And uh, it was pretty unique for teams to get the bowls has grown over time. And uh, after this year, actually getting into next year, there's going to be over 40 bowls throughout the United States. And, and they, and they, Traditionally, we're in the southern warm state climate areas, but uh, they've grown to there's games in Detroit and Boston and in New York. And so it's grown even geographically as well. But there's there's a and there's actually an association that we all belong to. Um, the days used to be a little bit more competitive where uh, we used to compete uh, almost hand to hand combat as far as which teams would come to your bowl. It's a little bit more civilized contractually relationships. And so as a bowl group and association, we tend to try to work together a little bit more for the better of, of the, the for the good of the, the, the common bowl groups. But there's there's over 40 of us. 
Now, one of the things that I understand, uh, again, as an outsider, but as a curious person who, who likes to eavesdrop on conversations about things I don't know anything about, is that events like these are a great opportunity for fans to get access to a lot of different dimensions of the sports business. Players are here. Management is here. Uh, the marketing organizations are here. The fans are here. So for somebody, again, who wants to get involved just by by participating, maybe bring in their family sure. uh, or or their kids and they want to come and kind of get them in around the things. Obviously, they can come to the games. We'll talk more specifically about the schedule and things. Mm -hmm. uh, but what are the variety of different ways that um, folks who want to attend some of these events can find them have a good time meet yeah. some of the meet some of the principal players or uh, actors in this in this arena sure we, we can back up a little bit to the the question on the volunteers and i i would uh, tell people don't hesitate if you're if you're newer to the state you want to get involved in something that's uh to, either to meet people or be involved in a neat organization uh, get to our website and, and check out an opportunity to volunteer because you'll find yourself being able to do something that that you'll enjoy doing you'll get to meet people and that can turn you never know what that turns into uh besides friendships and relationships there get involved as patrick did and you know we are uh, very unique, I think, in the bowl business where I think we're very special and the special sauce that we have and, and you know, kind of what we get asked and what I like to say all the time is our volunteer base is second to none. Mm -hmm. And with that, the volunteer base and what they're able to do and the hospitality that they put on for our fans and our guests is absolutely second to none. And I think people would expect me to say that because we're part of this organization. But uh, from, from afar, I was not part of this organization. And, and the more I was the longer I've been here, even the more and more I realize talking to other bowls that we are unique and, and, and other bowls are envious of what we're able to do. So you were with Minnesota Wild for four years, then with the Coyotes hockey team here for an extended period of time. What is different and unique about the kind of role that you're in now and the football versus sure. hockey world? I've been to a Coyotes game once I've been to a football game, maybe once. Sure. So again, what is it from the inside operating behind the scenes? You know, there, there, there's some, some very common traits in that, you know, it, it, at the base of it, you're still, you're selling tickets, you're selling marketing partnerships. And the, the, those are the, the similarities, but really the difference, you have a private entity in, in the NHL and the NBA and the franchises where we are a nonprofit. And I'm not sure if everybody understands our role and our, our mission as part of the community is really to, to bring economic impact to the community through these major events, being the football games and other things that we do, and then giving back to the community. Uh, professional teams do do things in the community and give back, but that's really a core of our existence now is to give back to the community. And that that's the biggest difference that uh, between the, the professional team and what we do at the Fiesta Bowl. It's marvelous. And let's let's dial in the focus a little bit and talk more specifically about that. A number of months ago, we had a great conversation in this studio with uh, the, the management of Harris Action Casino and uh, Chairman Miguel from the Akshin Indian community. And one of the things I realized in that conversation that I hadn't realized before, because again, it's not immediately obvious, is that the casino and all the associated services and the vendors, the employment the, is a major economic development force in that part of Maricopa. And it sounds to me like you're talking about this organization in much the same way. So how does the economic development happen? Obviously, over 200,000 people may attend various events throughout that 24-hour period of time. So there's traffic and, you know, receipts mm -hmm. for all the businesses that support tourism. Uh, but what else is going on that really makes this an economic development kind of initiative? Patrick? Well, as you said, there's the hospitality. I mean, the hotels, the car rentals, uh, you know, there are, are, are so many vendors and, and other groups that that benefit from this. Uh, so the ripple effect is is is, a, you know, is all across the valley. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, economic impact that that really affects everybody. And again, this is the kind of thing where it really reaches from the highest levels to the lowest levels. You've got corporate partners, sponsors who are involved in, in a very significant way, bringing their people in as well, all the way down to the local vendors, the, the, the mom and pop places, the local street kind of vendors and things of that nature. Let's talk about the schedule itself, because there's a lot that's going to happen in this 24-hour time frame. As you say, there's activities throughout the year, but the, the focus 
you know, like I've got two boys and they've just learned that if you hold the magnifying glass up to the sun in the right way, it can really kind of focus the beam. So the focus of everything, the intensity is happening in this 24 hour time frame, December 27 and 28. So what's going to take place? There are a number of major events during that time frame. What's happening? Yeah, we, we, we've been through this a little bit before, but we uh, we crunched it this year. That, that beam's going to be pretty focused. And with the, you know, really our three major events are all going to happen within a 24 hour period, as you're referencing with that late football game on Friday night with our cheese it Bowl. That game's going to get over. And if you think of our, our staff and the needs, we're going to have some tired people when we get to the end of the weekend, because we're going to have to wake up be prepared and, and have our major parade event. And when that finishes, we're all going to run out to Glendale and have our major football game in the afternoon on Saturday. So in the 24 hour period, all guns blazing, we're going to have everybody uh, on, on full alert. And uh, on Sunday, I think we're going to all crash. Yeah, it sounds like it. And it's the same It's the same group that is doing the game operations. It's all our volunteers that are doing the game operations for both games. So it's going to be a Herculean effort. Uh, are they in uh, training right now, running wind sprints and uh, <laughs> exactly. re- resting up? Resting up. But, but that's the great part about it. You know, and, and this is, you know, this is the time of season, you know, if I'm back to the, uh, the economic impact side of things. This is the time of year where not a lot of people were, were traveling to our state. You know, so we have empty hotel rooms, things like that. So that was a big part of it even back then as, you know, so we're talking – you know, by the studies, 175 to $200 million every year of the impact of these teams, their fans coming in, staying at our hotels. And so that's a, that's a big part of what we do. And it's important for us to have that economic uh, engine and drive that through our events. Well, and it, it it just seems to me to be a great way of, you know, providing something, you know, in, in a time of year between spring trainings where yes. the baseball is doing the same kind of thing, bringing a lot of folks in, really driving uh, interest and engagement in local community. And, you know, I mean, one of the things we used to say growing up in Southern California was every January 1st when, you know, you were in Minnesota or, you know, Buffalo, New York, and it was freezing cold and you're watching the the Rose Bowl and it is 78 degrees and sunny. There's a spike in population growth that used to happen. Now the population dynamics have changed. Everyone's moving, not everyone, but a lot of folks are moving from California to Arizona. I can't help but wonder if the bowl is not playing that same kind of effect. So the festivities begin on Friday, December 27, with the Cheez-It Bowl. Now, there's a pregame party, the Oasis pregame party, that's happening before the game. Uh, it's a free tailgate, uh, open to all the fans. What's going on there? What what can people expect? Yeah, it, it is uh, open to all the fans, uh, and it's right outside of Chase Field. So uh, we have, uh, as we said, our two games. So uh, Cheez-It Bowl is at Chase Field downtown, and then uh, our Fiesta Bowl will be out in Glendale at State Farm. Fabulous. But those pregame, you come down early, you know, because it, it'll be a you know, postseason. It's, it'll be on the 27th, Friday night. Get down there early. There's going to be music and entertainment and, and food and beverages to be uh, and some enjoyed. For, yeah. Absolutely. So it's a good time to come down. Chase Field's a, a great venue to watch a football game. The way we uh, uh, fit in the additional bleachers in the game. You know, you think of a, ba- a, f- a baseball stadium. It's it's unique. And it's another one of the fun parts that we do. But it's a very unique setting. And it's, it's very intimate to watch a football game. And we get uh, great reviews from the fans and the players playing there. Parking is uh, limited, I imagine. Light rail is a great option. What are other ways for people to get in there? Well, I think a lot of people are probably pretty familiar of coming downtown for Suns games or, or the baseball games. But uh, I think there's, there's plenty of parking out there. But the light rail is, is, a, is a great option for sure. That's that dropped you off right next to the door. So that, that's a, certainly an option. There is there's parking throughout uh, downtown. So I, I wouldn't be too afraid to come down and, and find one of those lots. But uh, coming down early and enjoying the festivity, that, that's always part of the, the fun is, is the pregame, the, the tailgating and the, the fun, the, bef- the fun before the fun. And, you know, you just reminded me there, there are apps now and I, I just started using one, but there are apps that let you find real time parking mm-hmm. availability uh, and all the garages and things like that. nature. So that's always good. The game starts Friday at 815 p.m. But you, as you say, come down earlier, enjoy the the street uh, energy, the the vendors, uh, the the tailgate party. Then the next morning, Saturday, December 28, the annual Desert Financial Fiesta Bowl Parade starts at 9 a.m. and is a two mile route uh, through central Phoenix. So there'll be floats, balloons, marching bands, equestrian units, community groups, local celebrities, you know, the usual parade, uh, fun and games. The theme this year is women in sports. That's cool. There's going to be a number of trailblazing athletes tied to Arizona with Arizona connections who will be grand marshals for that event. Um, 
Looking forward to that. Admission to the parade, of course, is free. Get there early and get a seat, as mm-hmm. with all parades. At two miles is not a lot of uh, curbside, right? <laughs> but there will probably be bleachers and things at sure. various points. And then the uh, the big game is the um, PlayStation Fiesta Bowl, right? Correct. Saturday yeah. afternoon. What's the time frame for that? So we won't know that until Selection Sunday. So this Sunday, the teams are announced. Uh, so we won't know who our teams are, and we won't know what our time is. Uh, so it'll be either 2 o'clock or 6 o'clock for kickoff. And in part of that rotation, we are the playoff uh, site this year, one of the two playoff sites. We rotate that every three years. And so today is, th- this year is going to be a, a, in a little bit higher uh, higher value game, and we're expecting huge crowds. And I, I, we do have some tickets available, but I, I'd get them because we're going to be announcing the teams uh, on Sunday and sometimes tickets get pretty thin by then. So, uh, you know, look us up soon here to get your tickets coming in. We know we're going to have either the number one team versus the number four team or the number two versus the number three. So, you know, two of the top four teams of the country are going to come our way and, and hopefully uh, move on to the championship game. And th- that'll be announced this coming Sunday, December 8. Correct. Yeah. Okay, fabulous. So we've got two postseason games. One is the playoff semifinals and the, the, the Cheez-It uh, Bowl is – an. Another postseason game. Do we know the teams for that? I don't know how this works. No. Uh, so we have the uh, number six selection for the Pac-12 and number six selection for the Big 12. So it just depends on what happens with those other bowl games, how they how the teams filter down. Well, that's marvelous. I mean, this is something that sounds like a great opportunity to bring the family out, uh, come out with some friends, uh, get involved. If you've got the same stamina as the volunteers, you can do the whole thing from Friday through late Saturday uh, and certainly do get involved with volunteering as well. Let me ask you a, a personal question as we kind of wrap this up. Mike, for you, what does it mean to you personally to be involved in something like this? Why does this matter to you? Why is this the thing that you've decided to donate your your time and energy and intellect towards? Yeah, I probably touched on that a little bit, you know, in, back to the difference between the NHL and, and this. And well, th- this is a job for me. So we're, we're Patrick and hats off to Patrick on the volunteers because they put their time into this and, and they're, they're getting, you know, where I, I double their salary every year. So, <laughs> zero, you know, right. So we, you know, and I get, two extra stickers I, every year. We like right. to yep. kid around with that. But, you know, our, our volunteers are amazing and we don't do what we do. And, and we, I, I, truly believe we are the best of the best because of what we have in our volunteers. And um, I get paid to do this. This is my job. So, you know, it's maybe not fair on one hand, but the reason that what, what makes a difference for me is that this is still sports. This is, but it's given back to the community. That That's the one piece that, that really hits home a little bit more. And maybe I'm getting older in my age and stuff, but being able to do what we do and be as success, successful as we can to do what we do, that allows us to have some money left over and then give that money away. And that's really the mantra that we have internally from a, from a staff standpoint is let's treat this like a business. Let's, let's do as, as, as hard and as well as we can. So whatever money's left over, let's give that back to the community. We've been successful in uh, this year. We gave away $3 million in, in cash to local nonprofits. And that's the difference maker. So the, the Fiesta Bowl charities is a whole other dimension of this. We didn't really touch on, you have mentioned it a, mm-hmm. a few times. Um, can you speak to the kinds of benefits that are provided? Obviously, there's a huge range with the kind of contributions sure. that you're making. But what are the what are the what's the charitable giving side of this all about? Sure. And we we are our whole entity is a nonprofit. So, you know, we, we say charities and that, maybe that focuses a little bit more, but we are a nonprofit. So everything that we, we uh, try to take in, we look at as part of our, our nonprofit status. Um Youth sports and, and education are the three pillars that we have that we when we go through our grant cycle and give back money to the community, those are the three pillars that, and the lenses that we look through and when we're selecting who to give money to. But uh, three million dollars went to Arizona nonprofits to help them do what they do best. You know, we can't do everything, but we uh, look through and uh, filter out which charities that we think are, are doing the great things along the, the, the lines of the pillars that we believe in. And then we give the, the money for them to do what they do well. And, yeah. and part of that is our Wishers for Teachers program. So we just had our draft day, what, uh, middle of October. Uh, and that was a million dollars we gave away to, to teachers throughout the state. So uh, there were uh, $5,000 grants given out to 200 teachers all across the state. So we, we actually affected 40 different communities throughout the state of Arizona uh, with these grants. And so, you know, they can spend the money on whatever it is to improve their 
their uh, their classroom. So it's technology or sports equipment or, you know, we've had teachers that one, one teacher actually took her uh, chorus group to Carnegie Hall to perform. So, you know, it, it's it's things that, that like that, that really have that ripple effect uh, that, that, you know, we're so proud of. You want to see some happy people, give a teacher $5,000 to help out in her class and uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. you see some smiles. And, and that, that's, again, what what a lot of what it's about, you know, appreciating what they do, but putting some money in their pocket to help their classroom. Absolutely. And I mean, it's a it's a cause that touches so many lives in so many ways. You know, it's one thing to talk about the, you know, the three million dollars in aggregate or the 15.5 million that has been given to the Arizona community over the last nine years. But when you think about the individual touch points there, the kid that got a chance to do something that, that really might have changed the course of their life, mm-hmm. the tens of thousands of lives impacted by the when it trickles through the small contributions that get made in those micro moments. Sure. That's that's super inspiring. And I know having worked in the nonprofit world overseas, it's sometimes easy when we we need to work both sides of that spectrum. We talk about the big impact, but we also need to remember those individual moments. Absolutely. And, you know, those yep. kids you mentioned who went to Carnegie Hall, that's well, that's a memory that. Yeah. that will you know last forever. It may have changed lives yeah. uh, in that moment. Patrick, you're doing this for for triple zeros on both sides of the decimal point. Yes. <laughs> uh, why? What's what is the meaningful impact that uh, what connects you to this mission? So early on, it was the economic impact. I mean, the fact that we were, you know, helping the valley, you know, making you know, getting people to, you know, have a little more money in their pocket uh, during the holidays. Uh, you know, the ho- hotels were full, uh, you know, vendors got to make some money. Uh, early on, that's really what the focus was that, you know, we were actually benefiting the community. And uh, as we've evolved over the last, you know, 25 years, I mean, it's a 50 year organization, but over the last 25 years that I've been involved, uh, you know, the fact that we're giving so much back to the community and, you know, having these individual uh, touch points with the teachers or with, you know, the high schools that we donate money to, uh, it's it's incredible the amount of impact we've had on the Valley uh, with our charitable giving. Now, th- th- my final question, which probably should have been the first one, because so obvious is staring me right in the face. You're, you're listening to the to this. You can't see it. But the yellow jackets yes. uh, that you're both wearing. <laughs> what's the story with the yellow jackets? What is the yellow jacket committee all about? So uh, the committee is 130 uh, volunteers and then we have uh, 33 board members. So uh, those are the the active yellow jackets. And we've got, you know, a, a couple thousand, uh, uh, you know, yellow jackets that have retired over the years. But uh, uh, early on, it was uh, basically to to be noticed at a bowl game or at, uh, at the games we would go to. So um, early on, the founders uh, chose yellow because it stood out and uh, they were able to to have a, a little bit more recognition that way. And I'll, I'll share a, a size here because I, I was curious myself, you know, the yellow jacket and, and why, because it was newer to me. And I asked one of the founders, you know, you know, why yellow? You know, it, and I heard the same, you know, it was it was because we wanted to stand out. It was, it was a big time when we used to go to games and people saw somebody from the, one of the bowls. It was a big deal. So they wanted to stand out. Then I asked again the question, well, why yellow? The answer that I got was because orange and red and some of these other colors were already taken. Yellow was the only one left over. So I thought that was kind of funny. Probably somewhat in a joke, but uh, the biggest part is they wanted to stand out on the field and yellow did that. Well, it's a very nice yellow. It's a light yellow. It's not a, it's not a garish color and it, uh, you wear it well. And it sim- <laughs> symbolizes a whole community. As you mentioned, alumni as well, who have participated over the years, who have who have been on the Yellow Jacket Committee. Oh, yeah. So a, a, if you're at the events and you see somebody in a Yellow Jacket, go talk to them, thank them, uh, get to know them. And, uh, and that's another way to connect with the bigger organization. Absolutely. Mike Neely, Executive Director with the Fiesta Bowl, Patrick Barkley, Chairman of the Board. I'm excited for this event. Thank you very much for joining us in the studio to talk about it today. Thanks, Thanks for, having for having us. Yes. For all of us here at Business Radio X, this is Dr. Adrian McIntyre. We'll see you next time on Valley Business Radio. 